Well, uh, good afternoon to you all. Good morning, good evening to other places uh, in the world. First of all, I'd like to thank Gerald again for uh, a generous introduction. Um, today, I'm going to talk about 3D printing, polymers, and the circular economy. And uh, this YouTube uh, is by courtesy um, um, produced with Park Systems. So I'm a professor at Case Western Reserve University with the Department of Macromolecular Science and Engineering. And uh, this is our building yeah, in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm located at the fifth floor and some of the current group members. We are also home to Thinkbox, one of the first makerspace facilities in any university. And uh, here uh, one can access uh, various types of additive manufacturing and subtractive manufacturing facilities in an open environment accessible to students, researchers, and the outside as well. And uh, right now, uh, there's a lot of very exciting uh, things going on in terms of uh, collaborations and especially access to instruments uh, uh, from statuses, from 3D systems, but also various types of uh, uh, new developments in terms of uh, STEM outreach and using these facilities for uh, senior design projects. So uh, two years ago, I gave a talk at the World Economic Forum in Dubai and uh, outlining the future of 3D printing as it touches our lives today, as well as in the future, from robotics to bio-inspired design, uh, 3D printing in the outer space, as well as uh, tissue engineering, um, manufacturing of biomedical devices, uh, and so on. But really, I would like to focus today about plastics, polymers, the way we know them is that um, a lot of everyday things, including packaging, textile, uh, paints, etc., touches our lives. And we uh, sometimes do not pay attention to them as we should uh, in terms of disposal. Yet, one of the important things that 3D printing focuses on is the use of new types of polymers or even commodity polymers that will enter our economy through the additive manufacturing. Uh, before I go to focus on 3D printing, let me put a focus on the problem that is plastic disposal, that is plastic waste, that is uh, plastic that we found in uh, rivers, ocean. Uh, in fact, 90%, close to 90% um, of the plastic out there uh, will eventually form um, a big problem uh, in terms of the economic environment, uh, if not arrested, but also the goal of new materials is to bring back plastics into the economy through um, recycling. So many things, for example, that we don't see uh, is actually there and quite harmful. These are microplastics or plastics that have broken down and in fact are present in the environment and sometimes they can be part of our food chain. Uh, this plastic uh, in the ocean or garbage can actually be seen uh, via satellite and can extend as, as big as some of our states in terms of magnitude. And it's a perennial problem is going to be because they're not easily um, uh, decomposed. Where do plastics come from? Where we think about plastics as uh, an end product, but actually uh, in terms of their origin, of course, they are what we call petroleum-based biofeeds, uh, feedstocks or petroleum-based uh, feedstocks that uh, together we can lamp with gasoline, uh, oils, different types of lubricants, uh, um, fuel, etc. The end of the refining process is that uh, the monomers that are produced can be polymerized or converted into plastic through the use of catalysts. Today, most of our consumption of plastic is what we call linear 
in that uh, the plastics as used uh, comes from manufactured uh, refining uh, processes, but very little goes to recycling, as little as only 8%. The rest are basically uh, in landfills, leakage, incineration, and of course, ending up in the uh, ocean or um, uh, in, uh, re remain uh, undecomposed and uh, therefore uh, not easily recovered. What is actually interesting is that if this present trend continues, we will see more and more plastics in the environment. And although the uh, amount of oil uh, is, is going to decrease in terms of global consumption, yet a lot of that accumulated plastic uh, will be um, not easily part of the recycling chain. In other words, most plastic that was ever made is still with us. And uh, the amount of uh, recycling going on uh, is actually hampered by the economics of recycling in that virgin materials or virgin feedstocks can depress the prices of recycled material, rendering them uneconomical and therefore not a good business sense. In the future, what we really want to do is to channel most of that plastic into reusable recycled materials and therefore become part of the circular economy. And that means you drastically reduce the amount of wastage or you uh, use different or new materials or even recycling methods that converts plastic into uh, another useful life or life cycle. Uh, to this regard, many people are familiar with the term life cycle analysis or LCA. In LCA, one pays attention to the origin of the material extraction, the manufacturing using that material, its distribution, retailing, and then usage. And after usage, that material has to be disposed. And some of these materials are disposed, ending up in landfill, compost, or reuse or recycle, which are the preferred uh, methods of reusing them. And so in a life cycle analysis, one has to do calculations or modeling that takes into account the uh, lifetime uh, use or uh, uh, decomposition of the material. There are many stages uh, of this type of analysis. It can begin by looking at the input or the origin of the extracted material. So usually we're talking about oil, gas, mineral or other types of feedstocks based on wood, cellulose, water, etc. The processing and the transportation and the use of the material is part of the um, an algorithm that can then determine how much of that discharge or output can be uh, harmful, reuse or even um, um, dispose of properly. Now, a lot of this has to be part of the environmental impact assessment. So many types of life cycle analysis actually uh, doubling as also an environmental impact aside, assessment aside from the economics of manufacturing. Here we can see that emergent supply can go through many types of uh, uh, processes on its way to a product that can be used and then finally dispose or recondition or recycle. Each of these stages actually consume various amounts of energy and material and generates various amounts of carbon dioxide. Hence, a lot of attention could also be done in terms of uh, CO2 um, um, analysis or generation as well as uh, um, minimization. Well, let's talk now about uh, prototyping versus production. So most of the plastic I've shown you are produced and are not prototypes. They are high volume production uh, materials that can be made by injection molding, uh, extrusion, thermoforming, etc. However, 3D printing as of now uh, is still getting into the high throughput, high production stage. And therefore most of the uses so far 
has always been in terms of prototyping or one-of-a-kind parts uh, production. But in the future, we will see a very high interest in taking additive manufacturing towards high product uh, output. And therefore, it is never too early to think about their uh, um, contribution to the circular economy. So in 3D printing, what we have is an advantage of complexity as well as uh, uh, limited production. Yet compared to conventional manufacturing technologies as shown here, uh, the amount of the uh, uh, product um, produced uh, in, in increases in size or volume once the original cost of tooling or producing the tool that will allow high throughput manufacturing such as injection molding has been overcome. With 3D printing, one does not have to go through too much tooling process because the additive nature uh, in building up the material uh, does not necessarily represent a basic molding injection extrusion requirement. In other words, you can make quite complex designs and parts. Uh, that statement can also be seen in this graph, which distinguishes lot size versus additive manufacturing. You can see here that methods such as casting, cutting, extrusion uh, can produce high volumes, whereas additive manufacturing or the more complex it is, uh, it, it, uh, it is not as easy to end up with a high or big lot size. So there is a manufacturing gap that is still is being solved today. Uh, just a review. Various types of 3D printing are classified in this um, uh, chart. Uh, when we talk about plastics, most of it is produced by FDM or fused deposition modeling. Yet polymers can be additively manufactured either by uh, SLA, stereolithographic apparatus using resins, or selective laser sintering using powders. Other types of manufacturing can involve powder jet, inkjet head, plastics, Plastic, plaster based 3D printing, and a number of uh, them I'm not going to mention now refers to materials using uh, metals and ceramics. Here you can see one of the challenges of fused deposition modeling in that uh, when a polymer or a plastic is printed, one goes through a melt and then quenching process. That material is then laid out and through a CNC movement can be deposited as quench layers or quench um, extruded materials on top of each other. And there are problems that are present, not only the anisotropy of the thermomechanical properties, uh, which also leads into weakness of the material and therefore they cannot serve as direct part replacement, but more often as prototypes. In SLA, as you can see here, one can deal with powders. So other than polymers like polyamide, polyether, ether, ketone, uh, one can work with powders based on metals. The powders themselves are generated as raw materials. Again, doing the life cycle analysis means that the production of, five, of powders actually costs a lot of energy. And taking that material and then 3D printing it uh, uh, is a more expensive proposition compared to FDM. Uh, in lith lithography, SLA, DLP, the resolution is very good. Uh, one photon polymerization involving acrylates, uh, uh, cross linkers, uh, results in very high resolution photo polymerized uh, designs or uh, raw resin massive materials, and therefore another direction towards polymerization and uh, production of parts. Okay, so here are some differences of SLA and DLP, primarily based on the light source direction, the movement of the elevator and the uh, uh, preparation of the resin that is eventually autopolymerized. A faster process is based on the clip process that was patented uh, uh, and, and with the company called Carbon. Here is a list of materials that has been 3D printed. Uh, as you can see here, 
polymer materials represent one column, but really metallic materials, ceramic materials are equally important. Now with polymers, we have many choices. We can be dealing with commodity polymers such as polystyrene, PVC, uh, polyethylene, but uh, one can also 3D print high performance polymers such as PEAK, PPS, uh, ULTEM, etc. Although these polymers are more expensive and has to be print, uh, print, printed at a higher temperature. So, so what I'm trying to point here is that we have lots of material choices. And an important question is this early in the game with 3D printing, how much of the development is actually centered on renewable uh, materials or looking at the life cycle analysis of polymer or plastic materials towards the circular economy. Uh, here I'm just showing that two types of ma uh, main materials that has been 3D printed are what we call thermosets and thermoplastics. Now there's a very important difference here. Thermoplastics can be recycled easily. They can be recovered, melt, and then brought into the supply chain again. However, thermoset resins are cross-linked, highly cross-linked, and once they have been fabricated, they are not easy to recycle. In fact, that is a big problem with the automotive industry and many industries that produce a lot of thermosets that cannot be recycled and therefore either incinerated or put in landfill. Now here, you can see that the necessity to have a, both a thermoplastic and thermoset resin is governed by price and performance. So the choice, uh, not only in terms of their recyclability, has to be matched with their price and performance, as in many other uh, materials used for industry. And the potential for consideration of recyclability goes towards many future industries that will be impacted by additive manufacturing. As you can see here, from biomedical to marine, oil and gas, to aerospace, automotive, increasingly many parts will be 3D printed or fabricated using additive manufacturing. And therefore, one needs to pay attention early in terms of their um, recyclability. Now, one may think that the volume is small and therefore, the, who cares? Or what is really the use of uh, uh, recyclability at this stage? Well, as I mentioned, the industry will eventually move to higher build volumes. Think about 3D printing cars, car parts, and aircraft wing or uh, wind turbine energy blades. And therefore, the volume is actually going to be big when looking at the parts that can be produced or the amount of materials that can be produced at high throughput production rates. Think about these uh, uh, contributions to the automotive and aerospace industries uh, where high build volumes uh, can be eventually be used uh, not only for prototyping, um, new types of design, but also for parts replacement. How about engines? Uh, is it possible to look at 3D printing playing a role in light weighting uh, uh, as well as performance of engines? Think about 3D printing engine parts with metal replacement using peak ULTEM or PPS, for example. Uh, rapid type prototyping versus production means bigger machines, bigger build volumes, high throughput production. And therefore, this type of um, economies of scale demands that one day these parts manufactured using additive manufacturing has to be disposed or recycled. Uh, as I mentioned, the interesting thing with 3D printing is that you can have one of a kind on demand materials that can be produced on site, no subtractive uh, manufacturing needed, which is actually a positive in that in the current environment of subtractive manufacturing, lots of exogenous, exogenous materials or materials that are left over has to be disposed. Not in the case of additive manufacturing. Uh, in which one layer at a time of material is deposited until a complex geometry is formed. Uh, think about light weighting, how many cars are produced uh, um, worldwide and how many parts based on plastic come to replace uh, metal parts or the interior parts 
uh, that has to do with the life cycle of the automobile when finally it has to be disposed in a junkyard. Carbon fibers, uh, carbon fibers, fiber composites. Fiber composite uh, is a, an expensive process, yet many types of um, direction in manufacturing goes towards light weighting or replacement of metal parts with carbon composites. My question is how much of fiber composite is recyclable? The answer is since it's a thermoset, uh, it is not easy, if not impossible to recycle. Uh, but usually it becomes part of the landfill or incinerated. Now, an interesting question is what about other materials that can be used as a feedstock in any manufacturing? I like to show this chart in that many raw materials in the agricultural industry uh, or, or uh, biomass or even waste streams are what I call negative costs or raw materials that are can be used as feedstock for any manufacturing. In fact, the interest on this is that with different types of treatment or uh, production, and of course, uh, this requires energy, uh, the use of catalyst or separation method results in low cost intermediate feedstocks, can be, which can then be used as a feedstock that replace uh, either bio-based or petroleum-based feedstocks in manufacturing, including plastics. Uh, another question is bio-based plastic. So what do we mean by this? Bio-based plastics could be natural polymers or cellulosic in origin, uh, which can go into polymer production, which actually is presently used in textiles or films, or production of monomers based on plant-based feedstocks that results in um, um, being part of the agricultural industry. So for example, ethanol, uh, produced in uh, as as a raw material from agricultural products uh, is actually used in fuel. Yet many types of monomers like lactic acid or lactides can be used for production of a mm. commonly 3D printed material such as PLA or polylactides. Uh, there is a challenge between petroleum versus agri-based feedstocks. Uh, when the price of oil is low the agri-based agri feedstock is not attractive. Yet when the price of oil is high, uh, agri -based, agricultural based feedstocks or even bio-based feedstocks are attractive but can sometimes impede the agricultural and food industries in terms of the supply chain. Uh, this is uh, showing that one, for example, can look at the desirable properties of uh, um, materials directly derived from their source. Okay. Uh, in an LCA analysis, for example, uh, one can take into the aspect of uh, the economics of using materials, their environmental uh, effects, uh, and therefore looking at this chart where one can compare different types of plastics, high-performance polymers, for example, or bio-based plastic. There's preference for bio-based pl uh, plastic, yet uh, the economies do not uh, sometimes warrant a switch toward a more bio-based material because of performance. In other words, a lot of companies desire performance more than the green design or the bio-based source of a material. Okay. So let me uh, look at this uh, uh, in terms of other types of uh, um, uh, prospects, for example, in the case of the uh, uh, petroleum industry, there's a lot of interest on using bio-based drilling fluids, okay, or the automotive industry looking at various ways of recycling, as you can see here, the production of car parts. A lot of this at the end of the cycle has to be disposed, separated, and therefore materials when it's once separated or sorted, which is part of the, the reason why um, uh, renew, uh, recycling uh, can be economical is that in order to separate them and obtain the raw source, for example, with ABS, uh, a lot of energy and effort is expended and therefore producing an ABS filament as shown here is not as simple as it seems. 
Yet there's a lot of groups, there's a lot of interest on direct recycling of, uh, let's say, plastics uh, for use for packaging. And uh, therefore, one of the interesting uses, if not uh, in many types of social responsibility uh, projects uh, or community development involves recycling and using it for 3D printing. And as you can see here, 3D printed parts can be properly sorted and then melt, extruded to produce filaments. Uh, and there are many types of filament makers available uh, for the hobbyists. Uh, and of course, many types of extrusion facilities can handle even bigger volumes. Uh, another is the rubber. So rubber is a thermal set elastomer uh, that is used uh, every day, of course, where transportation uh, is needed. Yet annually, lots of rubber uh, goes to the landfill. And the reason is that, as I mentioned, thermosets are not easily recycled, or sometimes they use, are used for incineration. Yet there's a lot of interest on recycling rubber or using rubber uh, for 3D printing, as shown in this um, new graph. Now, the remaining slides, I'm going to talk more about the current projects we have. Here is a collage of various types of nanomaterials from carbon nanotubes to graphene to metal, metal oxides, and fiber. The reason I'm showing this is our ongoing projects uh, in my research group uh, uses nanomaterials to help strengthen polymers or plastics such that you have a higher lifetime of 3D printed parts with higher performance and thermomechanical properties. And we do this by adding these nanomaterials like graphene, carbon nanotube, pause, uh, cellulose nanofibers. So with my remaining uh, time, I'm going to show you what we have done uh, with the use of graphene and cellulosic nanofibers, which is, by the way, bio-based material from Abaca uh, to strengthen these materials. So graphene, uh, as well known as, as is nanoclay and other types of filler materials to prevent stress crack propagation. In other words, you can have increase in the uh, impact strength uh, and, and in general uh, tensile properties with the addition of uh, as, as little as 0.1 to 3.8 percent of a nanofiller. So such is the case that we demonstrated with a 3D printed composite of polyurethane and polylactic acid using graphene oxide as a compatibilizer as well as a strengthening agent to improve the properties of TPU. So here uh, shows the procedure we did. We simply uh, took various ratios of the graphene oxide with the TPU PLA blend. We prepared filaments and then used them for 3D printing. So as you can see here, once we prepared these materials, we can then 3D print them uh, and you can see here a black color, but yet an elastomeric property of the TPU was retained uh, with addition of graphene oxide to as much as 5 weight percent. And just to show you the flexibility of these materials, uh, which does contain graphene oxide, we were able to maintain that property. What we observed is that we can get different types of strength based on tensile or compression behavior uh, using the directionality as a way to test uh, different strengths uh, based on the printing direction, which is, by the way, the weakness of 3D printed materials, in that compared to isotropic um, injection molded materials, uh, the layering causes it to have one strength in one direction over the other. Yet in this exercise, we can we observe that the addition of as little as 0.5 weight percent graphic graphene oxide improves both L and S uh, uh, compression strengths. In other words, regardless, irregardless of the direction of printing, the addition of graphene oxide improves the strength uh, of the material. Here uh, is another uh, view graph. Uh, I'll just draw your attention to the tensile modulus. So we were able to improve the tensile modulus with as little as 0.5 weight percent addition uh, to 75% uh, more. Uh, in fact, the percolation threshold uh, has probably been reached uh, 
even with smaller amounts of graphene oxide. And the addition of 5 weight percent GO or graphene oxide did not seem to increase it, the strength that much. And we could attribute this to uh, properties that resulted in aggregation, perhaps during preparation. The last story that I'm going to point is how we've used nanocellulose that is derived from abaca. Abaca is a type of hemp, uh, which is used for rope making or textile or, or paper manufacturing. Yet nanocellulose, uh, which can be obtained from many other plant sources, can be obtained based on the breakdown of the fibril uh, using various methods um, uh, to extract the nanocrystals or crystalline part of the alpha helix uh, from either the cell wall uh, or other types of the plant sources. Uh, so here we were successful essentially in obtaining nanocellulose from abaca and then we incorporated this in SLA 3D printing using polyethylene gly glycol diacrylate resin uh, resulting in higher performance at various weight percentages, percentages of the CNC additive. Uh, so the CNC looks like this. As you can see here, these are nanocrystals. We can also obtain nanofibrils based on a different procedure. The nanocrystals were then incorporated with PEGDA resin, including the photo initiator and the diluent monomer, and then 3D printing. The result is we printed different types of test materials, including compression and, and dog bone structures, which allowed us to measure the properties of these materials based on uh, tensile strength, uh, tensile modulus, fracture energy, elongation calculations. And what this result showed to us is that various loadings of the CNC uh, can produce these changes in strength and elongation, uh, in particular, as little as 0.3 weight percent produce some of the best performance uh, for this nanocomposite material. So with that, I'm happy to conclude this talk. Hopefully what I've given you is an opportunity to consider as early as now that in 3D printing, there is room for um, the circular economy. Uh, the volume is, no, is, is slow for now, yet 3D printing will grow with volume, with build volume, with throughput, uh, in the future and that it's never too early to consider the life cycle of this material, uh, including their performance uh, in the plastics economy. And my point here in linking uh, 3D printing and uh, um, the circular economy is that a lot of the materials that will eventually be printed is based on plastics and therefore educating, doing research on new types of materials or use of strengthening uh, nanocomposites such as what I've shown in these last two examples are primary considerations for 3D printing in the future. So with that, I'd like to thank you and um, Gerald uh, will be happy to take questions or you can email me at rca41 at case.edu or search me by the web and send me your questions and I'll be happy to correspond with you. Thank you and good night, good evening or good morning. <laughs>